Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Sing that again. Bind us together. give God glory today. We'll go ahead and dismiss our children to Children's Church as well. While I get situated, I'll remind you that uh, there are note sheets in your bulletin today um, and uh, free notebooks for anyone that would like to use one uh, for that purpose also want to encourage you, um, I was blessed by those of you that played along last week. If something from today's message resonates with your heart uh, and you're a Facebook person, uh, if you put hashtag the PRBC, um, it's just an easy way to tell people uh, in your social networks what God is teaching you through his word. Uh, it also blesses my heart to see um, that God's word is ministering to you uh, through our ministry here at The Ridge. So we started this series last week on how you can know that you're absolutely sure that you have salvation. How can you be absolutely sure that you are heaven bound? How you can have assurance that you're a part of the family of God? And by the way, that is the most important question in our lives, is whether we are in Christ or are we not? And it's such an important question that, that God does not want to leave us wondering and speculating about the answer to that question. And so he gives us vital signs in his Bible to tell us about things. I've named this series Absolutely Sure um, after the book um, by the same name by Dr. Stephen Lawson, uh, which has been one of its primary sources. I just want to say this because I don't want to ever plagiarize. Uh, the sermon is my own, but Dr. Lawson's book has been beneficial in understanding the short book of 1 John which was written by John the Beloved, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So as always, the Bible is the basis of our sermon today, but I'm thankful for godly men and good books that help me understand the Bible so I can preach it clearly. First John highlights at least nine vital signs of what genuine salvation looks like. Think of these like when you go to the doctor and they run tests on you and they, they want to know what's going on with your heart, so they check your blood pressure and they check your pulse rate and if you, they need to, they even give you an EKG or a heart cath and they check your breathing and they bring out the stethoscope and they want to hear if there's any obstruction to your breathing and they want to look at your diet and they want to look at all of these comprehensive things to understand your health as a whole person. We're going to see nine vital signs that are spiritual vital signs that would, would encourage us to know if you have these nine vital signs, then you can know, be absolutely certain, if you sincerely have those things before the Lord, that you are born again. However, if you have none of them, you, you likely are sitting over here or over here in the lost or the deceived seat. You say, Pastor, what if I have like half of them? Am I half saved and half lost? I would encourage you this. If you have some of them, but not all of them, then either one of two things is true. Either you're over here and you're right on the edge of getting to where you need to be so you can have absolute surety of your salvation, or you're over here and you just have some areas in which you need to grow. Perhaps no one has explained these things to you, and maybe you just didn't know that that was something you should be striving for. Either way, though, I think all of us could say we have 
room for growth in all of these areas. But I want to stress to you today that knowing where you are in Christ really depends on these vital signs and others in Scripture. So the first vital sign we're going to look at today is fellowship with God or friendship with God. Now, to help us understand this, I'd like to introduce you to two of my close friends. Um, Both of them have passed on, so they couldn't be here today, so pictures will have to suffice. Uh, The first you likely know. Uh, You guys can see them on the screens. I've got my little picture here, but those are better, so I'm just going to put them down. The first you likely know, if you don't know him by face, you'll know him by name. His name is Adrian Rogers. He's a close friend of mine. He served as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention for three separate terms and is considered one of the best preachers in the last century. During his time at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, the church grew from 9,000 in 1972 to 29,000 in 2005 at his retirement. His sermons still air even after his death through his radio and internet ministry, Love Worth Finding. He authored several books and in fact wrote one of the forwards to the book that's the basis for our sermon series. He's one of my heroes of the faith, and I am regularly blessed and challenged by his preaching. He's a good friend of mine in that he has blessed me immensely. Sadly, he didn't know that he was a good friend of mine before he died in 2005. I never had the opportunity to meet him or even hear him preach in person. Though I know lots about him, I did not know him, nor did he know me. The second man that I want to introduce you to is a man that you may not know his name. His name is Fred Wolf. He was a friend of Adrian Rogers, and by that I mean he actually knew Adrian. Along with Adrian, Fred was part of the conservative resurgence, which helped steer our denomination and its seminaries in a more biblical direction. While pastoring Cottage Hill Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama, the church experienced explosive growth. It's still one of the biggest churches in the city today. He served in ministry for 62 years faithfully to Jesus without compromise or accusation. He also is one of my heroes in the faith. He also is a close friend of mine. Now, unlike Adrian, I actually knew Brother Fred very well. He was one of my mentors and a dear friend. In a time when I had no godly mentors to learn from, Brother Fred came into my life and put his arm around me. I loved him as a father. He blessed me, he taught me, prayed with and for me, and encouraged me. And I can honestly say that without God putting him in my life, I doubt that I would be in ministry today. I know that I would not be the man I am without having him as a father in the faith. You see, I had an intimate relationship with Brother Fred. We would often meet at Cracker Barrel, where I could feast on two of my favorite things, pancakes in time with a godly man that loved Jesus enough to love me. In fact, I had one of those meetings with him only weeks before he passed into glory in 2020, shortly after we came to Pleasant Ridge. I have fond memories of sitting at Cracker Barrel with Brother Fred, this man uh, that loved Jesus enough to love young pastors. And I remember um, one day he he brought me a couple of the books that he authored to give them to me. He was like a father to me. I loved him dearly. And the little girl at the checkout kept trying to ring up the books that he wrote and brought with him to give to me. And, and Pastor Fred was such a godly man. He's trying to gently encourage her to let her know, no, I wrote these books. To which she would say, uh-huh, bloop. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 I wrote these books. And she said, that's great, bloop. And, and we just went on like 20 minutes. And, and he was starting to get agitated. And I finally had said, ma'am, you don't understand. He brought these books that he wrote. You don't sell them in the Cracker Barrel old-timey store. He's giving them to me. Which she looked at me and said, bloop. And, um, <laughs> uh, and so, but I have fond memories of Brother Fred. I have fond memories of Adrian Rogers. And I regret that I never got to know him in person. Um, Being friends with Brother Fred, I feel like in some sense I'm one of Adrian's spiritual grandchildren. Uh, But both of these men had a huge impact on my life. But you see, there's a keen difference between someone who you know lots about and someone that you've sat across the table of Cracker Barrel eating pancakes with. There's a very different relationship there. I have nothing but admiration and love for Adrian Rogers. In fact, I will tell you, when I hear him preach, which we listen to him often in our household, I almost always think I should never preach again because he was just that good. 
But there's a different relationship that I have with Brother Fred. Now, Brother Fred was a tremendous preacher as well. But I will always think about him as a man who loved me, that sat across the table from me, that would call me late at night. I remember he'd call me on a Saturday night, and he'd say, Preacher, if you don't know what you're preaching on, you're in trouble. (laughs) He put his hand on me, and he blessed me and encouraged me. And I will tell you, for a young pastor going through the ups and downs of ministry, to have a godly man like Fred Wolf come and lay his hand on me and say, son, you are doing a good job and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do and God is pleased in you. I would not be here today if it were not for Brother Fred. If you can't tell, the point that I'm trying to make today is that the first proof of genuine salvation is an intimate relationship with God through Christ. It is not merely knowing about God, Jesus, or the Bible. It is not merely going through the motions of religious experience. It is not merely admiring from afar. It is intimate fellowship, intimate knowledge, a personal and powerful relationship. Without that, we cannot be certain of our salvation. With that in mind, let's look at God's Word in John 1, the first seven verses. What I'm trying to tell you today is, if you want to know that you are in Christ, you need to ask yourself, have you ever sat across the table him with pancakes? Is that the relationship you have with the Lord? Intimate fellowship or just knowledge and admiration from afar? I'm just going to read the first seven verses of 1 John chapter 1. We'll come back and put them all together as we go. Uh, Can we do this since it's a new series and make sure you're not falling asleep? If you can, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word today? 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I pray that today if there is someone here that does not have an intimate relationship with you, someone that knows you from afar, that knows about you, Lord, that today would be the day you call them, you invite them, you draw them into that intimate personal relationship with you. Lord, we rejoice that even though we are sinners, we can have a fellowship with the Holy One because of your grace and your mercy. Why would we ever settle for anything less than knowing you and being known by you and making you known? Lord, where we have failed you, forgive us, wash us clean. But Lord, I pray today that every person here would draw closer to Jesus by the preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, we pray you would anoint our ears, anoint the words from your word. They are alive and they are powerful and we worship you, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, I stressed I stress to you that the key difference between someone who sits in these two chairs versus the person who's truly saved really comes down to one word, faith. What faith? The faith in Christ. And it has to be the right kind of faith. We talked about pistuo and relying upon and getting in the wheelbarrow across the tightrope of Niagara Falls. That kind of faith. But today we're going to see there's an additional thing that we have to be careful of. We have to have faith, the right kind of faith, but we also have to have faith in the real Jesus. We have to have faith in the right Jesus. Look again at 1 John 1, 1 and 2. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Before we dive into these verses, some historical context is needed. As we've seen, John wrote this book 
so that those who believe in Jesus could know that they have eternal life. That's the primary theme of 1 John. However, there is another issue at play. By the time that John the Beloved wrote this epistle, there were already heretical teachings coming in the first century church. The primary one that was active, and by the way is still active in some senses today, is what we call Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Gnostics claimed, and I'll tell you a brief summary of them, Gnostics claimed to have secret knowledge that God had revealed only to them, and they taught things that were contrary to the biblical gospel. A key component of Gnosticism was this. They believed that the physical universe was inherently evil and the spiritual reality was inherently pure and good. So according to them, Jesus could not come in the flesh because he is divine and the divine cannot have physical form because it'd be wicked. So just keep in mind because our first point is that salvation requires faith in the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible. The Gnostics believed that Jesus came as some kind of ghost or apparition. He didn't come in the flesh. He was not fully human. They did not deny his full divinity, but they did deny his full humanity. And I want to tell you, I I said something last week that I want to give some context to. I had people asking me about this. I encourage you to listen carefully to what preachers say, myself included, teachers on the radio, teachers on TV. But I want to tell you the number one litmus test for a preacher to know if they are sound or unsound is what do they say about Jesus? These two common issues have been at the heart of every heretical teaching in in the church's history. Either they try to rob Jesus of his divinity, he's just a good guy, he's just a good teacher, he's just like us, he is not, he is God, we're going to see that, or they try to deny his humanity, he is both, biblically, and that is why 1 John writes these things. You say, what are some counterfeit Jesuses in our culture? I'll just give you a few. I don't want to spend much time talking about the fake ones because I'd rather talk about the real one. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses both have different Jesuses than one another, both different than the Bible's teaches. Muslims believe in Jesus very differently than we do. Buddhists even believe in Jesus very differently than we do. My personal favorite that I learned about in seminary was the Church of the Holy Mushroom. This was a real heresy. And according to the Church of the Holy Mushroom, Jesus was nothing more than a group hallucination by the disciples when they were high on mushrooms. This is historical. Look it up. That is a fake Jesus that can help no one. How about these that we see in our culture? There is the Jesus of Hollywood award shows. I want to thank Jesus for helping me make this vulgar music or this vulgar movie. I don't think you got the right Jesus there, buddy. There's the Jesus of the touchdown dance that cares supremely about which team wins the Super Bowl. Not saying that all football players or actors aren't Christians. I'm just saying that many of them have a false Jesus. There's a Jesus that is no more than a genie in a lamp or a divine Santa Claus that exists only to give us what we want. We were talking about this in our deacons meeting this morning. About 10 years ago, there were billboards everywhere. There was this message, God is for you, which is a misquotation of Scripture. I believe God is for his people. But God does not exist for us. He doesn't exist to fulfill our wants and our agenda, and our our life is not about us. And God's life is certainly not about us. God's life is about his own glory. And yes, he's compassionate and gracious. And yes, he blesses us with all good things. But he is not a genie in the lamp that we just call on in a moment of desperation so because we need something or we have wishes unfulfilled. These are false Christ. They cannot save anyone. They have no life, no power, no forgiveness. We must have the right kind of faith in the right Jesus to be saved. So what is the biblical Jesus like? John stresses two of the most important aspects of who Jesus is both here and in the Gospel of John chapter 1. We're going to flip-flop between 1 John 1 and John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. So keep your finger here. We're going to kind of go back and forth. I already mentioned them to you again, but I'll stress it again. Characteristic number one, Jesus is fully God. Notice that the first words of 1 John is, What was from the beginning? 
John here is reminding us not only of what he wrote to open his gospel, the gospel of John, but that is a throwback all the way to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John is emphatically reminding us that Jesus was not created. In fact, he is the creator. Go to John chapter 1 with me. Let's look at the first five verses of the gospel of John, some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. And yes, the gospel of John is my favorite book, my singular favorite book of the whole Bible. John chapter 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I love this one. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now can we just go through this a little bit? Jesus is the Word. I I don't have time to explain really why John uses that particular metaphor here, but just understand it right now that that was a metaphor that his audience was very well used to. Uh, It was a Greek concept, and he's writing to Gentile people. This maybe doesn't make sense to us so much, but it made a lot of sense to them. Jesus is the Word here in John 1. Notice in the beginning, he's already there. We'll talk about that in a moment, but check this out. And the Word was with God... And the Word was God. Now, I want to tell you, I have done extensive research on those words in Greek because there is a false teaching that suggests that what should be said there is the Word was with God and the Word was a little g God. And I want to just tell you, not to take my word for it, I'll be happy to explain this if you have the uh, stomach to sit down and look at a Greek New Testament with me someday. Um, But there is no bearing for that translation of a little g God. It's clear in the Greek that the word is with God and he's one with God. Jesus is divine. Not in a lesser capacity than the Father, but one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now listen, you don't have to understand the Trinity to be saved perfectly because if that were the case, I don't think anybody would be saved. But you do have to believe in the right Jesus. And a Jesus who is simply a good man cannot help you, cannot save you, cannot redeem you. He is God. And then John, I think, emphatically refutes the idea that he's a created being here. Verse 1, in the beginning was the word. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, look at how redundant it is. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. You would have to be a special kind of student of the Bible to read those words and say, I think Jesus is a created being. And yet people have done exactly that. All things that were created came through him. Nothing came into existence except through him. He's being as emphatic as he can. And in verse 5, I love this, the light that is Jesus' light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I just point this out because it's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Notice the verb tense there. The light shines. In Greek, that's present active indicative. It's continuously shining. You can't stop it from shining. It just shines. But notice the verb tense of the darkness did not comprehend it. Comprehend is katalambano. It means to throw out or overwhelm. Comprehend doesn't really sum up that. The light is still shining in the darkness. The darkness tried and failed to overthrow it, and it couldn't, and therefore the light still shines. That's Jesus, still shining, still saving, still redeeming, still leading, still answering prayers in the darkness. And I want to tell you, beloved, I am jazzed up after preaching a year in Revelation because we know the end of the story. The light shines all the way through eternity. Remember we saw in Revelation 21, 22, what lights up the city of New Jerusalem? It is the same light that is shining in the darkness today. It is the light and glory and splendor of Jesus Christ. Do not tell me he's just some good teacher. Adrian Rogers is a good teacher. I love him, but my faith is not in him. Because a man cannot help me any more than I can help myself. Jesus is the divine Son of God, one with the Father, one with the Spirit. You have to have the right Jesus to have the right reward. But Jesus is not only 
God. By the way, uh, this idea isn't just in John's writing. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says it this way, the Apostle Paul, for by Jesus all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, who would read that and say, I think Jesus is a created being? Paul, emphatic. The Bible is emphatic. And by the way, you will hear people argue today that Jesus never claimed to be God. That is an ignorant claim of Scripture. For what do you think they killed Jesus for? Why do you think they were so incensed by him, the religious leaders? Because they understood that when he said, I'm one with the Father, that he meant he was God. They understood any time he would say, I am whatever, that he was claiming to be God. And when he said that I'm the son of man, in our culture, son of God carries more weight, but in the Jewish culture, it's the exact opposite. The son of man is Daniel. Daniel's talking about God coming down and God redeeming and restoring. Jesus, all throughout the New Testament, makes claims of his divinity, and that is why they killed him. There were other reasons, but that's the primary thing that they hated about Jesus, because he had the audacity to claim equality with the Father. But there's another category about Jesus that we have, to, we have to keep with us. Not only is he fully God, but he's fully man. Go back to 1 John 1, verse 2, and keep your finger in John because we're coming right back. What was from the beginning, that's what's divine. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our minds concerning the word of life. John is saying, yeah, he was from the beginning. But we touched him, we talked to him, we walked with him, we saw him eat, we heard his jokes, we saw his miracles. He's not some ghost, not some apparition. No, we talked to him and touched him. Go back to the Gospel of John, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 10 down to 14. We're going to skip down a little bit. The, the part I'm skipping, by the way, is about John the Baptist, and he's, he's cool and everything, but I want to focus on Jesus today. John chapter 1, verse 10 down to 14. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own creation, and those who were his own people did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He came into his own creation. That that is an amazing statement. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, Everything in creation came through him. Nothing came into creation apart from him. His light is still shining. And then John turns a corner and he says, and the creator comes into the creation and he dwells among us. And there is a play on words there in the Greek. I I mentioned it in my reading. I added some words there. That he came to his own, that is his own creation. And those who were his own people, the Jews, did not receive him. But look at verse 12. What a great verse. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What a great verse. His own people rejected him. But for those who receive him, you're adopted into the family of God as one of his children. You're given eternal life instead of eternal death. And I love how he says it. It's not by blood, meaning you can't inherit this from your forefathers. The Jews rested solely on their forefathers and their lineage. And when you get further into the New Testament in the book of Romans, Paul says that not everyone in Israel is actually Israel, meaning that there's more to this relationship with God than just blood and hereditary. My friend, I want to tell you, your father, your mother, your grandparents cannot be saved on your behalf. I have known reckless souls who have told me that their parents were godly enough that it should cover them. That's not the way it works. It's not by blood. You can't inherit 
this salvation, nor is it of the will of the flesh or the will of man. You know what I think that simply means is none of us can save ourselves, would save ourselves, except for the gracious impact and and Jesus coming and offering such salvation. And then using the Holy Spirit to draw us. We're all that diseased in our sin nature that we would not come to him. In fact, we could not come to him unless he makes a way and does all of the work for us to come to him. Verse 14 would have blown the, his, his audience's mind. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally tabernacled among us. And check this out, I love this. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see how John just ping-pongs between these two ideas? He's God, he's man, he's creator, he came into the creation, he's God, he came in the flesh and lived among us. We saw his glory, glory of God, but we saw him physically just ping-pong because Jesus is both God and both man. And can I tell you why that's intrinsically important to the gospel? The word priest Uh, which, by the way, we are all called as Christians to be priests in the kingdom of God. You read 1 Peter. As Southern Baptists, we have a a great doctrine called the the priesthood of the believer. That means every believer is a priest. There's no clergy and laity divide here. But the word priest literally means a bridge. How do you go from sitting over here to sitting over here when there is an eternally wide chasm between the two? We needed a bridge. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, is the only person who can suffice because he's the only person that can represent God to us because he's God and also can represent man to God perfectly because he's also perfectly human. He's fully human, fully divine. He's the only person in all of history that could serve as the bridge to carry us from here to here. That's why it's important that we don't neglect one of those truths. If you say he's just a man, then he can't help us any more than anybody else can. If he's just a man, he's dead somewhere like Muhammad and and Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, and all the rest of them. And if he's just God, he doesn't really understand our struggle with sin. And yet Hebrews says he was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet he never sinned. I've shared this with you before. I'll share it with you again because as my wife tells you, I only have a couple of stories. I remember several years ago, I thought I had outsmarted God. I, you know, I know that's dumb. You, just, you say that out loud, and you're like, you shouldn't tell people that. But I thought I had outsmarted God, and this is what I had come up with. Well, God, you know everything, but you don't know what it's like to lose. Because how could you lose? You are all powerful. You're all wise. I said, God, you know everything, but you don't know what it's like to be frustrated. How could you be frustrated? You speak things into existence. You you, you know what it's like to live in perfect everything, but you don't know what it's like to deal with what we're dealing with down here. And man, I was throwing a a righteous pity party, and, and there was about 30 seconds. I was like, checkmate. And the Holy Spirit convicted me so fast that what I was really doing was denying the humanity of Jesus. It was like God said to me, I was tempted in every way you're tempted, and yet I never sinned. You don't think Jesus was ever discouraged? Read the Gospels. There are times he's like, I just got to get away from these people. They're too stiff-necked. They're too stubborn. There are times in his, his exchanges with the disciples, how long will I be with you and you still won't get it? You don't think Jesus knows what it's like to be lied about, to be slandered, to be mistreated? Newsflash, he's done all those things much more than you and I. And it was this wake-up call for me to say that God does know the struggle of humanity because Jesus came and lived in that humanity, yet he never sinned. And can I just tell you, my view of Jesus went up that day because I see how much temptation barrages my heart and mind every day and how, how that erodes us and wears us out and discourages us and how eventually even the most godly person stumbles and Jesus being barraged every day worse than you and I, with every possible temptation, never even thought a sinful thought. And I said, that's a guy that I can follow to the ends of the earth. That's someone that I can worship. Because that kind of strength, that kind of wisdom, how would we not be in all of that? 
You ever try to set a record for how long you can go without sinning? Start the watch. Up, oh, messed up. <laughs> Made it 30 seconds that time. Lord, I'm moving. I'm going better. 33 years, Jesus never even thought a sinful thought. While he's being crucified, he's praying for those who are killing him. He's praying for you and me. That's a whole different kind of holiness, isn't it? That's a strength you and I only could dream of. You have to have faith in the real Jesus. And secondly, I love this. Go back to 1 John with me. You have to have fellowship with the real Jesus. We could say friendship. Although I do want to warn us that Jesus may be a friend to us. In fact, the Bible says he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother, but he ain't like the rest of your friends. Yes, talk to him. Yes, be open with him. Yes, draw close to him. But I want to tell you, you better do so very carefully because he is also God. And I love how Colossians says it. He, in him, all things hold together. You know what I think that means? If God wants you to cease to exist, you just cease to exist. I always tell people it's like getting on the, on the power pole out there, those guys that do that. You got to get up there and mess with all that high current but you got to know it will end you if you mess up. You got to get up there. You got to get close to it. You got to work with it. You got to come into its presence, but you better do so carefully. This Jesus that we're talking about, yes, he's a friend. And yes, this father wants you to crawl up and curl up in his lap when you're struggling and cast your cares on him, but you better come in reverence because he's still God. Look at fellowship with real Jesus with me. First John chapter one, verses three and four. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. The key theme of these verses is personal fellowship. First, John says that he had a personal relationship with Jesus. He walked with him. He talked with him. He heard the divine teachings and witnessed the miracles. He even was a personal witness of Jesus' death on the cross, being the only disciple that stayed there. And he's a personal, he was the first one at the empty tomb of the disciples, a witness of that. He was a witness of the resurrected Christ. And don't forget that John also witnesses Jesus' ascension into heaven and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And he even witnessed the end times through the Revelation. So when John says, I have seen some stuff, he's seen everything. He knew him personally. He walked with him. John uses the word testify to speak of his eyewitness account of Jesus. I want to ask you a question. I know we may not have the same kind of way that we can testify as John did, but can you testify? Do you have a firsthand story of how Jesus has impacted your life? how he has redeemed you, how he's forgiven you, how he's sealed you with his Holy Spirit, how he's working in your life today. John said, I can tell you a story about how Jesus came into my life. And you might be thinking that you've outsmarted God right now, but I haven't seen him physically. I haven't heard him. I didn't have the same opportunity as John the Beloved did and the disciples. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he saw that coming and he had a checkmate waiting for you if you're thinking that right now. Because Jesus says, you see me and you believe, but there is a special blessing for those who don't get to see me physically and still believe. My friend, you are more blessed today if you believe in Christ without the physical testimony, without being able to see him in person and hear him in person. And by the way, when we read the word of God, we hear the voice of God. And when we read the word of God, we see the glory of God. When we behold creation, Romans 1 tells us that we see divine attributes of this creator God, even his eternality and endless power. So we have some measure of seeing the glory of God and hearing the word of God. It may not be as much as we would like. It may not be like what John the Beloved had. But my friend, do you have a testimony of Jesus encountering you? Not just in general. Not just I believe God is good, or I go to church, or I'm, I, I do this and I do that, but have you sat across the table with the Lord Christ? My friend, have you ever been in the worst season of your life, and you fall to your knees and you put your hands up because you know the only person that's really got you is this Jesus who died for you? 
in your greatest triumphs, have you ever been at that place where all you can think is, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, because I know you set me in this moment. I want to encourage you. I pray that every day for a very specific reason that God sent me to pastor this church. I pray that every day because I was ready to give up. I was ready to throw in the towel completely, and God sent me to a church that loves Jesus enough to love a clumsy, goofy pastor enough to support and encourage someone that was on the brink of giving up. And man, look how God is blessing our church. It has nothing to do with me. That's the goodness of God at work. Have you sat across the table from the Lord? Do, do you yearn to get in the scriptures? Can you imagine, you may have to think back a ways, but remember, men, when you were trying to woo your lady, and ladies, when you were playing hard to get, you know, before there were texts and emails that have become so impersonal, so dead, I hate them, you would write a letter to your lady, and you would, you would put it out there. Because, men, it, sometimes it would be easier to give a note and run away than, than actually, like, deal with emotions and stuff that we don't know how to do. Can you imagine how sad you would be, men, if you wrote a love letter to your bride, to your love, and she just said, eh, I'll read that later. I'm like, I'm not writing you another one. Forget about that. Happy Valentine's Day to you. You'd be lucky if I get you a card next year. God has sent us a letter. I, I remember, I, I, and I had a weird childhood. I moved a lot, and so my, my best friend, who was a Navy brat, he moved a lot. And this was before you could text each other or play video games and stuff. Like, we would have thought that was the coolest thing ever. And so we would write letters to each other. And I remember checking the mail every day, every day, every day, every day, because I was excited to hear from my best friend who I hadn't heard from. And every day I come home from school, I check the mailbox. And when there was a letter in there from my best friend, the first thing I did, throw the backpack down, rip it open, and we would write multiple page letters, and we would, I would just sit there and read it. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you have a hunger for Him? Are you grieved when you dishonor Him? Can you imagine a husband who has no concern for the well-being of his wife? A father who has no concern for his children. Unfortunately, we don't have to imagine that because we live in a world that has those very evils. But can you say that you're a child of God and not care at all when you dishonor him, when you drag his name through the mud, when you sin against him, when you, when you pile up sins for which he died? You see, there's a difference between just thinking good thoughts about God and saying, no, this is what people say, and this is what I say, and saying, no, I have a fellowship with him. And so I don't sin, because I'm, not because I'm afraid he's going to strike me with lightning, but I don't sin because I don't want to dishonor the God who loves me and paid everything for me. And when I need wisdom, I need to go to him because I need to hear his voice. So I have the wisdom to live the way he wants me. Do you have a testimony? Can you testify not about what your wife does, what your parents did? Well, I'm talking about you and the Lord. Intimate, personal relationship. My mother's a very godly woman, and she always told me growing up that God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. There are no orphans in the family of God. There are no black sheep in the family of God. There are no redheaded stepchildren in the family of God. We are all equally loved and prized by the Father and by the Son and by the Spirit. And there is an invitation for every person to have an intimate, powerful relationship with God. Now, I don't understand why God wants a relationship with me or you, but I, I don't understand even less why we would not want a relationship with Him. He stands with his arms open. Come to me. Know me. Be known by me. Be used by me. Be empowered by me. You need wisdom? I give it generously without reproach, James says. You need strength? Renew, I'll renew your strength every day, Isaiah says. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Because we're invited to that. Look at, again at 1 John 1, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. Why? So that you may have fellowship with us. 
And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see what John is saying here? We're telling you about who Jesus is, and we want you to get excited about this, not just so your head can get filled up, but so you can come into a fellowship with him, with us. It's as if John here is is trying to um, help us find this relationship. He says, I have a relationship with him. I have fellowship with him. Listen to what I say so you can have fellowship with me. And if you have fellowship with me, you've got fellowship with the Father and the Son. The word fellowship here is koinonia in Greek. It means a relationship or a partnership. I want to read to you what Dr. Lawson says about this. I thought this was so insightful. Think about your walk with Jesus. This is Dr. Lawson. More than a mere social contract with another person. It is the formation of a joint venture together between two or more people. Originally, it pictured several men entering into a business together and working side by side. It is entering into a partnership with Jesus in which we share our lives with him and he with us. Having entered into intimate association with God through Christ, life is now lived as a joint venture with the Father, the Son, and the one who is genuinely converted, end quote. Fellowship. It's a joint venture venture. It's a partnership. It's as Paul says in Galatians, that I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live Christ living through me. He says, the life I now live, Christ lives through me. That's fellowship. Another form of fellowship here. John says he's got fellowship with God. He invites us to fellowship with God, but there's another one included here I'll just mention briefly, that believers have an intimate relationship with one another. John invites us into a relationship with God through Jesus, but he also mentions that believers have fellowship, quote, with us, that is with all other believers. Believers are knit together by the grace of God. We go from being spiritual orphans to being a part of the family of God. We used to not be a people, but now we've become the people of God. Now look at 1 John 1, 4. I want to, I think this is such a cool thing. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. You say, what is John talking about? Because that verse kind of seems like it breaks the flow of fellowship, 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 joy. Make my joy complete. Why is he saying that? Well, this is the way I think it makes sense to me. His joy is complete when more people come into fellowship with God and with Christ. That's the whole invitation here. Hear what I'm saying, hear about Jesus, come into fellowship with me so you can be in fellowship with him, and if you do that, if you respond to what I'm saying, then my joy is complete. We get that, don't we? Because each of us, if you're a believer, you have people in your life that you are praying for, for them to come to Jesus and have the relationship with him that you have. Imagine, mama, how much your heart would explode if your wayward adult children came to Christ today. You think you could get on board with what John the Beloved's saying? My heart is just overwhelmed. My joy is complete. I love that. Because part of being in fellowship with Christ is we're going to have the same burden for people that he does. And that means we're going to rejoice that same way when people come into the family of faith. And by the way, you know the Bible says that angels throw a party every time somebody gets saved? Can I just tell you, when that happens, we need to check our Southern Baptist card and we need to get excited about what God is doing. Our hearts should explode with joy when someone comes into the family, and that's what John is saying. you got to have faith in the right Jesus so you can have fellowship with the real Jesus. And thirdly, you need forgiveness from the real Jesus. Look at 1 John 1, 6 through 9. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of John's favorite metaphors is light and darkness. Light representing holiness and good, while darkness represents evil and sin. Notice this, that God is the embodiment of perfect light. He is perfect in holiness, his goodness, his righteousness. In him there is no darkness at all, no wickedness, 
No sinfulness, no evil in this God that we're talking about. He is pure and holy and righteous, this God. But because God is perfectly holy, we cannot have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness. Pay attention to that phrase, walk in darkness, depicts a pattern of behavior, not merely that you have sinned, but that you are in continual, unrepentant, and unforgiven sin. How can sinful people like us have fellowship with the Holy One, the light of the world, the righteous judge? The answer is we must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. John says if we confess our sins to the Lord, there is forgiveness available because Jesus died to pay the penalty for the rebellion of sinful men. I want to just camp out here a second. We're almost done, believe it or not. But look again at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say we're friends of Jesus, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. One of the reasons, uh, I love 1 John, but a lot of times people, when they read it, they say, I don't understand. And I'll tell you why it's a hard book sometimes. John does what I call the theological term is he ping-pongs. He goes, pong, 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 pong. I'm going to show you an example of that right now. He says, if you say you have fellowship with Christ, but you are living in unrepentant, unconvicted sin, he said, you have lied to yourself. You have deceived yourself. Can I tell you, I believe Christians sin. I know I do. But I would tell you, there is no more miserable person on the planet than a Christian who is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he sins. If you can sin and not be convicted, if you can sin and not care, if you can sin and think that no one sees or no one knows or there are no consequences or judgments coming for you, if you can sin and think that, hey, God's just going to fix it in the end as if that's some frivolous thing, my friend, you are probably not in the kingdom. You are probably sitting right here. You cannot walk in the light of Christ and walk in the darkness at the same time. Now, I want to tell you, there are seasons in our life where we get turned upside down, where the devil tricks us and our flesh tricks us, and there are seasons, days and weeks, maybe even months and years, where we're living in the darkness. But I want to tell you, no child of God can stay there without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You want to know you're saved, dear friend? How do you feel when you sin? Because if you just say, hey, it's another Tuesday, whatever, I want to tell you, that's proof that you're probably sitting over here. I want to tell you, when I sin, I am miserable. Anybody testify to that? The Holy Spirit, man, he will dog you out. You can't get it off your mind. Oh, and then Satan comes, and he, he starts, you know, the very devil that says, come on, it's safe, it's good, come do this, come do this. The moment you do, the shame and the guilt and the attack and all this nonsense. And here's Jesus saying, come to me, come to me. You sin, you say, I I don't even want to pick up my Bible because I'm afraid it would catch on fire or I would catch on fire for reading it. Or you sin and you say, the last thing I can do is pray because, because the Bible says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much and I'm not righteous. Beloved, let me tell you, if you are a child of Jesus, when you sin, you should confess, you should repent as soon as you can because it isn't God's heart that you would stay far off. That's what got you where you are in the first place. It's God's heart that you would have fellowship with him, koinonia with him, restored relationship and peace with him. But my friend, you cannot walk in sin and walk in Jesus at the same time. And you may fool every single person on the planet, but we read in Revelation, you cannot fool this judge with eyes of burning fire that sees every action, every word, every motive, every thought. He sees into the depths of your heart. Nothing can hide from him. And if you're sitting here today and you know that this is true of you, I am begging you to come into the light of Christ and be saved and so that that person can die and a new person can live. That's what the gospel is. It's not God just dust me off, just lift me up a little bit. I just need a little bit of help. No, you got to die and you got to be born again so that you can enter into the kingdom. That person can't come in because in him there is no darkness at all. And his his kingdom won't tolerate your darkness and my darkness. That is why Christ took our sin on his back and the penalty for that sin on his soul so that we could be forgiven and free. Do you not understand that Christ has given you his righteousness? He's wrapped it around you like a blanket. 
And when God looks at you, if you are in Christ, if you're sitting here, do you know what God doesn't see? He doesn't see all the times you blew it in the past. The psalmist says it's like it's from the east to the west. God knows everything. He knows every sin that you've ever committed. He knows every lie that you've ever told, every lustful thought. He knows it all. But when he sees a Christian, dear friend, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And he sees our sin placed on Jesus and Jesus dying for those who can't save themselves. You cannot walk in darkness. You cannot. And we think we can play games with God. I want to tell you, he is not to be mocked. And you may fool me. I'm not hard to fool. Matt and I talk about this a lot. Matt's a detective. He has a very different outlook on people than I do because he's seen a lot. We have this conversation a lot. He tells me, Pastor, I always want you to be right because I believe the best out of people. But I'm still going to do a background check on him. He usually says. (laughs) (laughs) And there's been times that he's been right about that. (laughs) So y'all watch out if you don't want your background checked. uh, (laughs) Just be aware. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Look at verse 7, a big but here. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from, say it with me, all sin. You have two options here. If you walk in the darkness, unrepentant wickedness, unconvicted sin, you have lied to yourself, you're not in the truth. But if you walk in the light, that is walk in the holiness and the righteousness of God, you have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus covers all sin. Some people say, you think Jesus' grace covers past, present, future? I sure do. Because I'm going to tell you what, if I can lose my salvation, I would lose it every second of every day. It's only because I believe God is preserving me and holding me, and I'm holding on to him, but I'm so much, I'm so thankful that his grip is stronger than mine. He holds us fast. And here's a ping pong. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You say, John, make up your mind. You say, if, if I say, if I walk in sin, I'm in trouble. If I say I haven't sinned, I'm in trouble. Where am I supposed to be? You're supposed to be in verse 7. Verse 6 is one extreme. Verse 8 is another extreme. Verse 6, I'm just walking in sin unrepentantly. Verse 8, I don't think I even have any sin. Let me ask you this. If you haven't sinned, why do you need a Savior? We act sometimes as if, as if I could just almost get in through the gates of heaven. I just need a leg up. You remember a leg up? You get one of your friends to put their back against the wall and you put your foot here and you just, just a little leg up. That's what we need from Jesus, right? You remember the walls in Revelation? How big they are? You telling me a leg up's gonna get you over that thing? No. You need a crane to pick you up and put you in the city. Jesus didn't come just to give us a live. He didn't come to die for righteous people, but for sinners. So if you say, I haven't sinned, you don't need a savior, so you can't be in the family because you don't have the right faith and the right Jesus. Look at verse nine, another ping pong. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're gonna talk about this next week, so I won't dig too deep here. But that word confess is... Homo logomai in Greek, it means to say the same thing about. Confession of sin is not merely saying, oh, okay, I did something, I'm, you know, you caught me. Homo logomai is to say the same thing about. Lord, I confess to you that I, I, I lied, and lying comes from the devil, and that's not your ways. We can't, we can't live in that, and that's, for, that's what you died for, and so I am grieved that I just lied right then. That's confession. It isn't simply, I'm sorry. If you're a parent, you know exactly how this goes, don't you? I have two beautiful daughters that fight like you would not believe. And we have a practice in our house that we make them hug until they like each other. (laughs) Which usually ends up in more of a fight, to be honest, because they already got their hands on each other. But we'll, we'll have this thing where we tell them, you go tell your sister you're sorry for what you just did. I'm sorry. 
No, try again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, now you're going to have to deal with daddy. You're going to have to apologize to me now. You know how that insincere apology, maybe, you have, maybe you've argued with your spouse. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That's not confessing. That's not even an apology. That's shut up, I'm done with this. What a beautiful verse, verse 9 is. If we confess our sins, if we come to God and say, I agree with you that these things are wicked and destructive and they're unbefitting of someone that bears your name, they're not why you died for me. Look at this. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, read it with me, all unrighteousness. He's faithful and righteous. You know what I find? As I stand here, I have an epiphany. To say that he's righteous and to forgive us our sins is a contradiction. He's faithful and he's righteous to forgive our sins. Because normally a righteous person would condemn and judge sin. But it's only because of verse 7. It's only because of the blood of Jesus that the righteous one can take the condemnation we deserve and righteously give forgiveness that he has purchased. My friend, I want you to consider today, are you over here? Are you someone that doesn't believe in God at all? It's just nonsense to you. Are you someone here that knows about God and you know all kinds of facts, but you don't know him? Or are you over here, you've walked across the bridge and you know Christ. You know what kind of syrup he likes on his pancakes. You've had conversations with him. You've heard him in his word. You've seen his glory. You felt his tremendous mercy. You felt his comfort when you were ready to throw in the towel that you know that you're not perfect, but his righteousness covers you like a blanket. We stand as we sing and pray. If you're here today and you don't know, if you're not absolutely sure that you belong to Jesus, we're going to be available to talk and to pray. There's nothing magical about coming up here. But there is something so, so powerful about coming to Jesus in friendship coming to him and saying, Lord, I need you to save me. So if you're here and you don't want to come down, that's fine. I just encourage you to ask God this. If you're real, make yourself real to me right now. I, I want to have a relationship with you. I just don't know how. And here's what I believe. If you cry out to God in this moment, I do not believe you will find yourself wanting. Because this Jesus, this same God who spun everything into creation, he came into creation so you could know him. And he's standing with his arms open. He's saying to you, come to me. If you want to find him today, I think he wants to be found more than you want to find him. Will you sing and pray? Mm -hmm.